Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the John Howes Memorial Lecture for the 2021-2022 academic year. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that the University of British Columbia is situated on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Hunkaminam-speaking Musqueam people. For centuries on this land, the Musqueam and other Coast Salish peoples have lived and worked and passed down knowledge, and we are grateful for the opportunity to share that practice with them on their land. In a moment, we will welcome this year's speaker, Professor Chilson. But first, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Dr. John Howes and the origins of this lecture series in his honor. The Department of Asian Studies at UBC was founded 60 years ago in 1961 with John Howes as one of its founding members. He taught Japanese intellectual history in the department for nearly 30 years, playing a vital role in its phenomenal growth over that period as well as publishing landmark studies of modern Japanese intellectuals, such as Uchimura Kanzo. John's outstanding contributions to the study of Japan in Canada were so numerous and so impactful as to lead to his being awarded one of the very highest honors that the Japanese government has to bestow, the Order of the Rising Sun with Garter. But what I'd like to emphasize this evening, um, as I have in the past, is Dr. Howe's personality, his, his kindness, his generosity, and his engagement with his students. And uh, I'd like to read in full a long description that Dr. Roy Stars, a former student of Dr. Howe's, uh, the way he described this aspect of working with John. Quote, at a time when academics are often criticized for being devoted too exclusively to research at the expense of students, Professor Howes set an example for us all. He gave generously of his time and energy to help students at all levels with every manner of problem, whether it was a first year student struggling to understand the meaning of life or a PhD student trying to puzzle out the best approach to his dissertation. For one and all, Professor Howes' door was always open. Since a large university can often seem a cold and impersonal place, it was a great comfort to us to be welcomed by a warm smile and a friendly word from this large and rather fatherly figure. He brought a refreshing taste of small college life to a large university setting." End of quote. I remember too how when I came to UBC, John was always extremely welcoming of me and extremely patient with me as I picked his brains about his experiences in the uh, Allied occupation of Japan. And accordingly, because of um, this kind of generosity, when Dr. Howes retired, his grateful former students and colleagues joined together with his family in creating this annual lecture. And now, since his passing in 2017, it has become a lecture series, not just in his honor, but in his memory. I'd like to express our deep appreciation to his sons and other family members for their continuing support of the Department of Asian Studies through this important annual event. And now I'll turn the floor over to Dr. Peter Nosko, who will introduce this evening's speaker. Good evening and uh, welcome. Uh, it's really, it's a wonderful thing that you can join us this evening for this annual event, the, the Howes Lecture. It's a special event in the history of our, in the history of our department. Now for the pleasure of introducing this evening's wonderful speaker, Clark Chilson. Clark has taught at the University of Pittsburgh since 2006, and he's in two major departments. Uh, Really, I think you'll hear you'll hear a bit of both of these, you know, in his presentation this evening and later during the week. He's a, mem a full member of the Department of Religious Studies and a full member of the Department of Anthropology. His specialty, uh, as we all know, is religion in Japan, with a specialty in uh, 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 Buddhism and popular religion. Lived in Japan for about 10 years, lived in England for a few years. It's where he did his PhD at the University of Lancaster. Uh, in Japan, he was the associate editor of uh, really maybe my favorite journal. It's the Japanese Journal of Religious Studies, where he worked with uh, my long friend, uh, uh, Paul Swanson. He was also the associate editor of Asian Folklore Studies. And if you get a sense of Clark as a scholar who has a kind of encyclopedic knowledge of bibliography and who's in the field and who does what well and all those sorts of great questions, this you know helps you to understand how that came about. Clark is probably best known for a monograph, uh, uh, sort of a fascinating title and a fascinating book, 
It's called secrecy's power. Do I have to say any more? Secrecy's power, covert Shin Buddhists and uh, contradictions of concealment. Uh, really a profound study and I commend it to your attention. He also in 2006 co-edited with my old buddy, Paul Swanson, the Nanzan Guide to Japanese Religions, which is a massively helpful, hugely helpful uh, uh, bibliographic uh, uh, reference work. The title of Clark's talk this evening is uh, Buddhism and Psychotherapy in Japan. I believe that he will show that uh, mindful, unlike mindfulness in North America, uh, Buddhist influenced psychotherapies in Japan attribute emotional suffering to self-centeredness and to emphasize stronger social relations as a cure. Without any further words from me, I have the great pleasure of introducing Professor Clark Chilson. Thank you, Professor Nelskov, for that very kind and generous introduction. Um, I have long been a fan of Professor Nelskov's uh, historical work on the Edo period, so it is humbling to be introduced by him. Um, I would also like to thank the chair of the Department of Asian Studies, Professor uh, Orbong, uh, and the staff in the department, particularly Connie Wu, for the work they did uh, to make this event possible tonight. So I'm now gonna share my screen. So my talk tonight will be on Buddhism and psychotherapy in Japan. And I am honored to give this talk um, and to celebrate the legacy of Professor Howes with you tonight. Professor Howes was a giant in the field of Japanese studies. Um, all specialists on religion in modern Japan are indebted to him for his sustained work on Uchimura Kanzo, who was one of the most influential leaders in the history of Christianity in Japan. For scholars in Japanese studies, as well as those of us in the history of religions, Professor Howe's work has been tremendously important. I thought I would start tonight um, with a story uh, on Hisamatsu, uh, who was a famous Zen teacher and the psychoanalyst Carl Jung. In May, 1958, Hisamatsu was in Europe after lecturing at Harvard University. While in Europe, he was scheduled to have a discussion with the philosopher Mart Martin Heidegger. But a couple of days before meeting Heidegger, he went to Jung's home to have a dialogue on Zen and psychoanalysis. Jung had an interest in Zen going back to the 1930s when he wrote a rather long forward for the German edition of D.T. Suzuki's book, Introduction to Zen Buddhism. So it was not surprising that Jung was interested in talking with Hisamatsu. Yet on the day they met, their conversation began awkwardly and ended with tension. Hisamatsu started off by asking Jung about the state of psychoanalysis, but Jung wanted to know Hisamatsu's view first. Hisamatsu said he was not a specialist on psychoanalysis and wanted to learn its essential position to compare it with Zen. Jung then pointed out that he, Jung, was a psychologist and Zen is a philosophy. To which Hisamatsu responded that Zen is both a religion and a philosophy. And so the exchanges went. Eventually, the conversation progressed to a discussion on the true self. Hisamatsu said that it was something without substance and form, but Jung expressed reluctance to make such a definitive statement. At the end, exasperated, Jung said, I can state metaphysical matters until I'm blue in the face, but fundamentally, I do not know. Although their exchange failed, to provide a model of smooth interdisciplinary dialogue, they did agree on one thing, that Buddhism and psychotherapy were both concerned with liberating people from suffering. Jung even told Hisamatsu that the goal in psychotherapy is exactly the same as in Buddhism. 
In the decades after Hisamatsu and Jung met, psychotherapists in the English speaking world would take an even greater interest in Zen and particularly Zen meditation. Zen would be a major force in the development of the mindfulness movement. Mindfulness in that movement has focused on non judgmental, present centered awareness. Various psychotherapies used in Canada and the United States were shaped by it, including dialectical behavioral therapy for borderline personality disorders, mindfulness based cognitive therapy for depression, and third wave cognitive therapy that instructs people to relate to their thoughts by observing them rather than trying to change them. And so here is an example of some books that are indicative of this point. So we have there on the, on the left, the book Mindfulness-Based Cognitive Therapy for Depression. In the middle, um, Buddhist Psychology and Cognitive Therapy, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. And then on the right there, uh, uh, a popular book titled The Buddha and the Borderline, a memoir, my recovery from borderline personality disorder uh, through dialectical behavioral therapy, Buddhism, and online dating. Books like these have led many in the English speaking world to falsely assume that mindfulness has been central to Buddhist methods for treating mental illness. In fact, however, throughout history, that has not been the case. When we look at the relationship between psychotherapy and Buddhism in 20th century Japan, we do not find mindfulness or the idea of present centered awareness being emphasized for healing. Instead, we find quite different practices and ideas than those commonly associated with Buddhist psychology in North America and Europe. Tonight, I wish to share with you some of the different Buddhist practices and ideas that have been involved with treating mental illness in Japan. In particular, I wish uh, to show how Buddhism supported psychotherapy in 20th century Japan. I will start by showing how Buddhist temples offer religious practices and facilities for treating mental illness. Then I will focus the rest of the talk on the two so-called indigenous therapies of Japan, Morita and Naikan. I will show in the case of Morita therapy that Buddhist language was used to illustrate particular psychodynamics of those with anxiety disorders. Finally, I will introduce Nikon, a self-reflection practice which originated in Shin Pure Land Buddhism and show how it has been used to promote well-being and treat addiction. So first, let's start by taking a look at the traditional Buddhist psychotherapies in Japan. Before the 20th century, mental illness in Japan was commonly attributed to one of three factors, spirit possession, poison, or stagnation of key vital energy. Buddhist monks and ascetics were among the primary specialists for treating the mentally ill. Accordingly, it was common to take the sick and suffering to Buddhist temples. One such famous temple for treating mental illness was the Shingon Temple Daiunji in, Iwak in Iwakura in Northern Kyoto. Iwakura from the 1700s was widely known as a place for taking the mentally ill for healing. And to give you an indication of how Iwakura was famous uh, as a place associated with uh, people with mental illness, uh, I thought I would introduce you one poem by Busong. In Iwakura, a mad woman falls in love, the cuckoo. I like that. In the 20th century, uh, Daiunji was still a popular place for taking the mentally ill. It had lodging facilities for the ill and their families. So you can see here that uh, in the slide, the, um, the places circled with the red uh, ovals, those are komoriya. Uh, which were places, were lodging places where the mentally ill stayed often with their families. 
the treatments at Dai Unji were not quiet meditative ones. In fact, they could be quite loud. The monks at Dai Unji performed ritual exorcisms for the mentally ill. They also encouraged the ill to stand under waterfalls to purify themselves and drive out possessing spirits. Yet by the early 1900s, Japan's medical psychiatry began to grow. It was based on German neuropsychiatry and emphasized the biological aspects of mental illness. With the rise of neuropsychiatry, traditional practices for the mentally ill, including those at Buddhist temples, were called into question. One of the founding fathers of Japanese psychiatry was Kure Suzo, who studied in Europe for several years. Upon his return to Japan, he was particularly concerned with how the mentally ill were confined by families and got little medical attention. This led him to say this, famously, he said, the over 100,000 mentally ill people in our country not only had the misfortune of becoming ill, but also had the added misfortune of being born in this country, Japan. Now, what would have led him uh, to say this about his own country? Well, it was a report um, that Kure did with a research team of 12 people uh, that investigated home confinement of the mentally ill throughout Japan. Uh, the investigation lasted about six years and covered much of the country. The report is a polemical plea for change. It included over 50 photographs and many illustrations, uh, which showed the miserable conditions that the mentally ill were kept in. The historian Yumi Kim has argued that it was intended to induce sympathy and advocate for change in government policy. And you can see that the images are quite startling. So this is a, a photograph of a man confined to his home. Uh, here we see another photograph and uh, often these photographs are accompanied by detailed descriptions of the confinement spaces. There's also a number of illustrations that will uh, show what the confinement spaces look like um, in the home. And so in this particular illustration at the top there, we see in the upper left-hand corner, that was the confinement space for the mentally ill relative and the rest of the area was the living space. And there's numerous of these illustrations in the report. Although the bulk of the 146 page report deals with case studies of home confinement, chapter four focuses on vernacular treatments, including ones at four Buddhist temples. It is thus an important source for understanding therapies used before the rise of biomedical psychiatry in Japan. The report said there were superstitious ideas that mental illness was caused by fox, monkey, raccoon, or dog spirit possession, and that ritual prayers and hydrotherapies were used to treat the mentally ill. Kude points out, that most of the Buddhist temples for healing the mentally ill were Shingon and Nichiren Buddhist ones. I shall introduce three of the four temples mentioned in the report. So the first one is Niseki Temple in Toyama. At this temple, people were brought uh, to a waterfall. They would stand under the waterfall three or four times a day for about five minutes at a time. Uh, and we see in the, uh, the upper, frame, uh, although it's a little bit dark, uh, the report tells us that this is an 18 year old schizophrenic held by assistants called Goriki uh, under the waterfalls for healing. These assistants were commonly uh, local farmers and they were there to, to keep the, uh, the mentally ill person from running away so that they would be able to stand under the waterfall. And then interestingly, uh, the woman in the bottom picture is described as a 22 year old woman uh, with uh, a certain type of exhaustion that today we would uh, consider to be postpartum depression. Uh, 
Another temple in the report is Takosan Yakuoin, which is located in uh, Hachioji. And there, uh, one famous waterfall was the Biwa Falls at Takosan. We'll come back to this in a, in a minute or so. Um, sometimes family members recited sutras nearby while their relatives were under the waterfall. Uh, so the major one was um, the Biwa waterfalls, but there was also another one, slightly smaller one called the Benten Falls. Um, and what would happen is the family would often stand off to the side and recite sutras while their relatives uh, did this, this type of, of um, hydrotherapy, as Kure called it. A third temple is Hoke Kyoji in Chiba. Um, at this particular temple, the Satsudo was particularly important. Um, when the investigators from Kure, Kure's team inspected it in the 1910s, there were 25 people staying at the temple, of which 14 were mentally ill. Starting at 5 a.m., the mentally ill patients would walk down a corridor connecting the temples in to a building with an image of Kishibojin, the goddess of childbirth and children. And the report tells us that there were two drums in the hall. And so in this particular picture, we have three drums, but at the time there were two drums. And these drums were, were being um, played loudly, according to the report, uh, while people chanted, uh, again, very loudly and vigorously, and this was done for 20 minute intervals. And then there was a rest period for 30 minutes. And so from 5 a.m. to 9 p.m., you had this quite loud, vigorous um, therapy going on. Um, and so this definitely was not uh, the quiet therapies that Japan became known for later. An interesting point is um, due to the urging of psychiatrists such as Kure, uh, more mental hospitals were being built in the early 20th century. And they were often built next to temples that were famous for treating the mentally ill. So in this image toward the top here, um, the, the, the place circled in red is Daiunji, which we encountered moments ago. And then to the left of that is Kitayama Hospital, which is a major mental hospital in Kyoto. And then right below that, there's another temple building uh, in, 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 in the circle. And then below that, in the orange oval, we have Iwakura Byoin or Iwakura Hospital, uh, which is another hospital for the mentally ill. And this was true not just of Iwakura, but of places mentioned in Kure's report. So um, you remember near Yakuoin, there was the Biwa Falls that the mentally ill were taken to. Um, and uh, right near those Biwa Falls was uh, a hospital built called Tokyo Takao Hospital. And then we have one more that I want to show you. So the, at the Hoke Kyoji, you'll remember there was the Satsudo. And so um, the, the circle there is of the Satsudo. And then right above it, there's a large mental hospital uh, called Nakayama Hospital that um, treats the mentally ill. So after Kure's death, it was a few decades before large numbers of mental hospitals were being built in Japan. But about 15 years after the war in 1960, there was quite an increase in the number of mental hospitals being built. And we see on this graph here that between 1960 and 2004, the, mental, the growth in mental hospitals uh, was pretty uh, strong in the 60s and then started to level off, but remained pretty high compared to the rest of the world where most places were reducing the number of uh, psychiatric beds. So Japan has more psychiatric beds than uh, anywhere else in the, in the world.
for Kure and other medical students, hospitalizing the mentally ill was important. Like many Japanese at the time, for Kure, modernizing meant adopting Western practices. In the case of psychiatry shortly after Kure's death, this meant uh, treatments such as insulin shock treatment and electric shock treatment. Biological interventions were common for treating the mentally ill, while non-biological interventions were rare. One of Kude's students, however, became famous for developing a form of psychotherapy, which was widely recognized as an indigenous therapy that used Zen. And that student's name was Morita Shoma. So now I'd like to transition to um, Zen and um, its relationship to mor Morita therapy. So Morita was born in 1874 in Shikoku. He was the first son of sericulturalists. He became famous for a distinctive therapy to treat anxiety disorders or those with what he called Shinkei Shitsu, nervous temperament. Growing up, Morita had a nervous disposition. Uh, at age nine, he tells us he saw a painting of hell at a Shingon temple that made him fearful of death and kept him up at night. After entering university, he had stomach problems and headaches and was diagnosed with having neurosis. At university, quite by accident, he made a discovery about his condition. It occurred after his father failed to send him money. Morita became angry with his father and stopped, and stopped taking all his medicines. He decided to study himself to death to make his father regret his treatment of him. To his surprise, however, after dedicating himself to his studies, his headaches and other ailments went away. This led Morita to think that immersion in activity could reduce problems caused by anxiety. When he became a psychiatrist in Tokyo, Morita decided to help others who had nervous temperaments. The problem for people with Shinkei Sutsu or nervous temperaments was that they thought obsessively about themselves, according to Morita. They were overly self-conscious and egocentric. This made their suffering worse. By concentrating on their suffering, they enhanced it. They were often hypochondriacs and felt distress over how reality differs from their personal desires. Although Morita consistently denied that his therapy was religious or developed out of Zen, he did frequently use Buddhist language to explain the problems of those with nervous temperaments. To illustrate the self-defeating psychodynamics of his patients, he used the Zen expression, Ketsu. It refers to a donkey tied to a post that tries to free itself by walking away. The donkey attempts to escape. However, it only finds that in the attempt to escape, it is walking around the pole to which it is tied and by doing so, not only fails to escape, but binds itself tighter to the post. So is the case, Morita suggested, with those who suffer with obsessive thinking. The more they try to escape their thoughts, the more they are confined by them. Rather than trying to escape pain, accepting it helps them break free of it was Morita's claim. Now, easier said than done. So to help his patients, uh, he developed uh, a four-stage therapy. Um, and this began in the 1920s. The first period is a five to seven day uh, period of bed rest. There's no talking, reading, writing, or any activity except going to the toilet, bathing, and eating. The rest of the time, the person uh, is to stay in bed, lying down. After the person has done that for five to seven days, 
the second stage begins. And at this stage, the person can get up and walk around the grounds of the hospital, observe things in nature, and do light work uh, that they see needs to be done, such as picking up leaves or sweeping. They also start, the patients also start to write in a diary, which the therapist then reads and writes in brief comments. If the patient writes too much about their feelings, the doctor may instruct them just to experience them. The third stage involves more intense and strenuous work. Patients do things that need to be done in daily life, such as watering plants or walking a dog. At this stage, pa patients are allowed to read nonfiction, but not fiction. The fourth stage involves the person engaging in more social interaction. They may go home for a time uh, or they may commute to school or to their jobs from the hospital. And the time frame for this is five to 30 days. It really depends on uh, the individual. These stages ideally lead the person to gaining the ability to live in accordance with reality as it is. The term Morita used for this was Arugamama. Arugamama involves accepting things as they are and therefore not resisting. For Morita, Arugamama means moving away from self-focus towards social engagement and doing what needs to be done. And this concept of Arugamama, uh, scholars have pointed out, is similar to the idea in Zen of Sonomama. Uh, Morita also used Zen anecdotes and stories. I, I thought I would just share one of these with you. Um, one day, a monk questioned Dosan, a Zen master. How can we avoid the arrival of heat and cold? Dosan answered, go to a place where the hot and cold do not exist. The monk asked him to elaborate on this. He answered, when it is cold, lose yourself in the cold. When it is hot, lose yourself in the hot. This is what I, Morita, mean by obedience to nature. And so this is part of living Arugama. Um, after Morita's death, uh, the Zen style of Morita existed in a number of different places. Uh, this is a hospital in Kyoto called the Sansei Hospital. It was built by a student of Morita who was also a Linzai Zen monk. He was both a Linzai Zen monk and uh, a psychiatrist. And this had some famous visitors. So among the visitors was the, uh, the psychoanalyst Karen Horney, uh, who was introduced to it by D.T. Suzuki, and also the founder of Gestalt Therapy, uh, Frederick Pearls, visited there for a few days in 1962. Apparently, he wanted to use Morita therapy to quit smoking, uh, but this image suggested it didn't work for him. So what I thought I'd do now is I'm going to show you about three minutes or so of this video uh, of, that takes place at Sansei Hospital, which will give you a sense of what the hospital is like. Thank 
どんなことが起きるかボリボリついての意味をしっかり論じることをやめてかかっていかれればですねそれはものの要するにこう今の瞬間から神経症は成り立たなくなるより他ありませんからあよくわからないけど<笑>自分の説明のためにこれも使わないで先輩じゃないんだろうねっていう感じで。<笑>ということを言わない状態が見事な皆さん方の究極の姿です。よくわかるんですけど、先生。自分まで、こっちの方に重点を置いてないで。じゃないですね。Okay. So that was、uh, Morita and Zen. Now I'd like to, to transition to Shin Buddhism and Nikon. And so, under the, the word Nikon, there, the, the, the kanji or Japanese characters, the character on the left、uh, means inner. And the character on the right means looking, and so literally inner looking,、um, so introspection. Uh, Nikon was founded by Yoshimoto Ishin.、Uh, he was born into a wealthy merchant family in Nara, and his mother was a very devout、uh, Shin Buddhist. When Yoshimoto Ishin was about 19 years old, Uh, he was looking to settle his faith. He was, he was uncomfortable that, that his faith wasn't adequately settled. So, through family connections, he was introduced to a lay Shin Buddhist community in the Kansai region that did a practice called Mishirabe. So, this was a lay Shin Buddhist practice. The purpose of Mishirabe was to attain faith in Amida Buddha. And the practice involved fasting, so there was no eating, drinking, or even sleeping.、Uh, the quote unquote sick person reflected in isolation on sins that they committed. And then every hour or so, interviewers called enlightened ones would ask questions such as these Do you have more karmic seeds to go to the land of bliss or hell? Do you understand your sins? And then a sick person would either have、uh, a religious awakening to Amida's salvation or they would wind up quitting, often because they were, they were sleep deprived. So, Yoshimoto, he had to do this practice four times before succeeding. The first three times he failed. Uh, interestingly enough, his wife, Kinuko, she,、uh, she had a really religious awakening the first time she did it. But 
Um, Yoshimoto writes in detail about his experience doing uh, um, Mishidabe and says that when he had his religious awakening, uh, he was so filled with joy that he just cried and cried. He wanted others to feel as he did, but was concerned that few people would want to try Mishidabe uh, with the strict fasting requirements. So he decided in consultation with his teacher, Komatani, um, to remove the fasting requirements. And rather than doing it until a person had uh, a, a religious awakening, they would just do it for a set period of time. In the 1940s, he's tried to get uh, people to do Nikon. He was quite an evangelist for, for the practice of Nikon with limited success. He started to have some success in the 1950s after he became a prison chaplain and introduced Nikon um, to prisoners. In the mid 1950s, um, he would have them, the prisoners, ask themselves questions such as the following. Was I filial toward my parents? How deeply indebted am I to others? Have I done more good or bad in relation to others? And he set up a training center in Nara uh, where uh, prison corrections officers would come and do a week of intensive Nikon uh, so that they could introduce Nikon um, in their prisons. Um, former prisoners would also come and do Nikon here with him in the 1950s. In 1968, um, the Nikon questions were settled on these three. What have I received that is positive? So in Japanese, this is shite koto. What have I given back? koto. And what troubles and difficulties have I caused? So uh, the, the word translated troubles and difficulties is meiwaku in Japanese. Uh, in intensive Nikon, uh, this is done for one week at a Nikon training center or hospital. The person doing Nikon will sit behind a screen. Um, they'll typically do Nikon from about 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Uh, there's no distractions, there's no breaks. Uh, so there's no reading, no internet, no phone. Phones are taken away the first day um, and there's no talking to others. Ritualistic interviews are done about every two hours eight or so times a day. And the interviews or men setsu are usually less than five minutes. So they're quite short. Nikon is commonly done in relation to different people. So for example, Nikon on one's mother between the ages of 15 and 17, if one were to do a Nikon on, on their mother between ages of 15 and 17, they would ask themselves these questions. What did I receive that was positive from my mother between the ages of 15 and 17? What did I give back to her during that time? And then finally, what troubles and difficulties did I cause her at that time? Morita, I'm sorry, Yoshimoto's uh, disciples, they built a number of Nikon training centers throughout Japan. This is one in Tokyo in the rather upscale neighborhood of Shirokanedai. Um, I did Nikon here in 2011. Um, so you can see it's a quite upscale neighborhood. The, the, the building in the, uh, in the middle there, that's the Nikon training center. Here is the entrance to it. And you'll see that the entrance looks quite similar to Yoshimoto's place in Nara. Uh, when people come in, there's that picture there of, of Yoshimoto. And then, um, People are guided down the hall to their respective rooms. So the rooms look like this. Everyone gets a private room. Uh, and then they spend the week sitting behind the screen uh, doing Nikon. And the space in the, in the, uh, behind the screen looks like this. Uh, during interviews, the screen is open by pushing it to the side. And then inside the screen, um, there are a list of people to do Nikon on. So 
do night gun on your mother, your father, your, your grandparents, brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles. Uh, and then also the interview format is in there um, for people to follow. So the important thing is that people just directly answer the questions. Um, and they're to answer these questions using concrete details. Uh, meals are brought to the screen uh, while people are doing Nikon and then eaten in the screen. Uh, and then when the week is over, people just leave. You know, no one contacts you. You don't sign up for anything. Um, for most people, that's the last time they will do Nikon. What I thought I'd do now is I thought I would give you a, a demonstration of Nikon interview of a Nikon interview. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so you can see me better, All right? And the way this is gonna work is that when I'm facing this way, this is the Nikon interviewer. And the person facing this way is the person doing Nikon, okay? So I'm gonna come in and do a demonstration for you. the screen. During this time, what have you been examining yourself on? During this time, I've been examining myself in relation to my mother when I was between the ages of eight and 10. Uh, what she gave me at that time was uh, a basketball. She also took me to swimming lessons. And she also took me to soccer practice and to soccer games. I also remember her helping me with uh, a report that was due. I had left it to the last minute and she stayed up with me till about two o'clock in the morning so I could finish the report. What I gave to her, uh, I remember one morning I made toast and scrambled eggs, and I brought them to her bedside. Uh, the troubles and difficulties I caused is that um, I wanted a dog and I never took care of it. Uh, when the dog got sick, my mother had to take care of it. Um, I also, one morning, I remembered I got in a fight with my older sister and I was yelling at my sister uh, and I woke up my mother when she was trying to sleep in. I also, uh, didn't do my homework at the time. I was a poor student and my grades were poor and this really concerned my mother. That's it. During the next period of time, what will you examine yourself on? I will examine myself in relation to my mother between the ages of 11 and 13. Thank you. And so that's what an interview would, would be like. Um, I'll go back and sh share my screen so I can share with you a bunch of photographs. Um, so here's another Nikon training center in Tochigi. Um, a number of People have done Nikon there. One famous person who wrote about his Nikon experience there was a, a baseball player. So sometimes performers, actors, actresses, um, athletes, they do Nikon as a self-cultivation practice. Um, and Kokubo Hiroki wrote about his experience doing Nikon in a memoir called Ishu ni Ikiru, or, or Live in the Moment. Um, and so this is what this Nikon training center looks like. Pretty similar to what we saw in Tokyo. Again, sitting behind a screen, place behind the screen, again, cushions. This is the bathing toilet area. Meals were also brought to the screen here and eaten behind the screen alone. Uh, unlike the place in Tokyo, however, this is more rural area. And so there were other places to do Nikon. This was a place uh, where a person could do Nikon in total darkness 
uh, while fasting, which I thought was interesting. Uh, Nikon has also been used in psychiatry. Um, so this is a headline from the Asai Shimbun in 1977, which says Buddhist practice uh, cures alcoholism. And that Buddhist practice was uh, Nikon. Uh, one doctor that's been uh, instrumental in promoting Nikon as a treatment for alcoholism is Takemoto Takahiro. And this is his hospital in uh, Kagoshima. Here's the ward for stress and addiction treatment. He also built a building in the mid 1970s just for Nikon. And so this is the Nikon building on the temple and the, uh, the uh, hospital grounds. And very similar to what you see in Nikon training center screens behind which people sit. Two more hospitals I'll introduce to you. This is um, GK Hospital in Okayama. Give you a sense of what the grounds look like. So this is a room in which someone was doing Nikon. So. And here we have the doctor uh, being the interviewer. And then one other place is uh, the Okayama Psychiatric Medical Center. Give you the dining area here. Okay, and it's in the addiction ward where Nikon is done. So here's the Nikon room in which um, a person who's an alcoholic trying to give up drinking would, would do Nikon. Uh, and here are a little desk for daily Nikon, often 30 minutes in the morning, people will do Nikon before they do a week of intensive Nikon. And they'll write in answers to the three questions. Okay, so the, the ideology of suffering in Morita therapy and Nikon is excessive self-focus. Both Nikon and Morita therapy are pro-social. They advocate for thinking less about oneself and assume that excessive self-attention to one's desires causes suffering. In Nikon, attention is given to how others have taken care of oneself, how they have been taken care of even when they did not behave well towards others. Problems Nikon practitioners say are caused by blaming others and the failure to look objectively at oneself. In Morita therapy, excessive self-centeredness is also seen as increasing suffering. Giving repeated attention to one's ailments and negative feelings, Morita therapists say, makes matters worse. Morita therapy emphasizes accepting life as it is and giving attention to what needs to be done, even if one does not feel like doing it. As with meditation, both Morita therapy and Nikon involve attention regulation. Both therapies try to train people to pay less attention to their feelings, less attention to things that were hurtful and less attention to unfulfilled desires. So in conclusion, um, Mark Twain reputedly said, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. In the early 20th century, traditional methods for treating the mentally ill at Buddhist temples were criticized by Kure Shuzo and other psychiatrists. They advocated instead for Western approaches, including the building of mental hospitals. Today, the indigenous psychotherapies of Morita and Nikon are both declining in Japan, while Western derived psychotherapies are on the are on the rise in Japan. The irony is that some of those psychotherapies imported from North America in part were influenced by the mindfulness movement, which in turn was influenced by Japanese Zen Buddhism. In other words, the Japanese are again moving away from indigenous therapies to embrace Western therapies, 
But this time, those Western therapies were influenced by practices and ideas that existed for many centuries in Japan, which Japanese did not see as appropriate for treating the mentally ill. This suggests that the future of the relationship between Buddhism and psychotherapy in Japan might be more influenced by what is going on in psychotherapy outside Japan than what is going on with Buddhism inside Japan. And I will end there and I look forward to your questions. So I'll stop sharing the screen now. Mark, thank you very much. I, I, I trust that uh, members of the audience can hear me speaking right now. Uh, during the time that you were speaking, and this was just fascinating, uh, uh, John Howes would have enjoyed this lecture. I have not the slightest doubt very, very much. Uh, there, I have four questions that I've received, and one member of the audience has submitted three questions, and one has submitted just one question, and there may be more questions coming. I wouldn't be at all surprised, but I'd like to just jump in, and actually all of these questions I find just about equally interesting, and regrettably, they don't consolidate into like a few smaller number of questions. Let me start with this. We can, if we can jump back to the 1920s, the 19, early 1930s, to Kure's time, uh, what would have counted as a cure and how common was it to experience a cure? So it's, it's hard to say. I mean, probably according to Kure and Shuzo's report, uh, there were some cures from what was done at the, the, the temple. So he wasn't, uh, Kure wasn't completely uh, opposed to what was going on at the temples. Um, but he thought that there needed to be a gradual shift away from them towards giving people uh, health care or mental health care in, in mental hospitals. Um, but we don't have any good data. Again, the types of mental illness being treated um, were numerous. Um, you know, we just, I mean, the success rates are not published. Um, but certainly if we look at the, the, the lengths of hospitalization in the post-war period, um, they were incredibly long. I mean, people would spend sometimes years. Schizophrenics in particular, there was very little uh, that was done for them uh, in these mental hospitals. Um, and almost all the treatments um, in the 20th century were, were, uh, were biological treatments. Um, very little, the Japanese were pretty skeptical about psychotherapy. Um, yes. Yeah, so the short answer is, unfortunately, we don't have good data. So would it be then uh, fair to extrapolate that it's difficult to uh, determine how effective, let's say, Morita and Nikon therapies are? Yeah, so the, the issue is, and this is a problem with mindfulness research as well. So the research on Morita and Nikon, it's typically done by people who have an interest, a personal interest in Morita or Nikon. So these are sure. the doctors or they're, they're doctors that... Um, that uh, use Nikon and they've done numerous studies. I mean, lots and lots of studies. There's a Nikon Medical Association. Um, there's, a, there's a Morita Association. And these studies, not surprisingly, show high levels of success. Just like the mindfulness studies are commonly done in the US uh, by people who are advocates for mindfulness. And so they show high levels of, of uh, success. Um, you know, double blind studies are just not that common in Japan for psychotherapies. Um, so if you believe the studies that are done, the success rates are quite high. Nikon particularly has pretty good success rates better than anything else for alcoholism. Um, but again, um, you know, th these are being produced by people who already uh, seem to believe that it works. Let me move to the, the next question. Uh, as it was phrased, is there a correlation between the many mental hospitals constructed in the last 60 years and the development of the economy? Now, you know, let me just elaborate on that question just a little bit, because, you know, I think it's widely acknowledged that for the last 30 years, the Japanese economy has been in a condition described as stagnation. So that is there something related to stagnation? that may be generating a lot of mental hospitals. 
it, or is the construction of mental hospitals something that a society does with surplus wealth or you know whatever other ways you might think to interpret that question? So historians think, you know, Janice Matsumura and others have thought said that um, as the economy grew, the, the labor to take care of a mentally ill relative was uh, a drain on the economy. And it was seen as more economically efficient to put mentally ill people in the hospitals so that family members could be productive in society in a way that they couldn't if they were taking care of their, um, of their mentally ill relatives. So that was one issue. Okay, that's one issue. Another issue was psychiatrists representing the mentally ill as dangerous for their own benefit. <laughs> so the idea was that uh, psychiatrists saying, you know, the mentally ill are dangerous, we're going to take them off the streets and we will protect society. Uh, and that actually had some, uh, some power, that was a powerful rhetorical argument in the 1960s after the uh, American ambassador Reischauer was stabbed by a, a mentally ill young man. Um, so those are two key reasons sometimes put forth for why there's a high level of, of uh, a high number of mental uh, psychiatric beds in Japan. Let me move to this next one. Um, were traditional rituals of sutra chanting and gong banging or drumming perceived at the time yes. as effective forms of sound or vibration healing? I don't think there was, I mean, I didn't see, I have never seen any evidence about it being sound or ev about being sound vibration healing. Um, you know, I think the idea was, is that there was religious efficacy. Um, the, you know, we could reinterpret from our own perspective today, we could reinterpret this as kind of a somatic treatment you know, the certain, you know, the, the cognitive bandwidth on people when there's lots of noise and they're reciting something loudly is diminished, which, which makes ruminative thoughts more difficult. But for the people themselves, uh, this seemed to be a religious ritual, uh, which was seen to have religious efficacy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I have to say that as we go through these questions and answers, uh, as instead of the number of questions becoming fewer, it's just expanding through the room. So it may be very difficult to get to all the questions. And I hope the audience is, is hearing this and is sympathetic. Uh, here's, a, a, I think, a fascinating question from the Shin Buddhist perspective. So I'm going to rephrase it slightly. How did, you know, in this approach of Nikon, how did a Shin Buddhist practice transition from belief in adoration of Buddha, which I interpret as exter exteriority, right? uh, transition to a complex system of introspection. Okay, so the idea was, is that by looking at one's life objectively, one would find that they were taking care of something bigger than themselves. That in other words, people do not live by their own power. Um, and so, a key idea in Shin Buddhism is this idea of other power and that yes. Amida saves us through other power. And so for people who do Nikon is, as a, from a Shin Buddhist perspective, the idea is that you can understand the saving grace, so to speak, of Amida by looking at one's own life objectively and seeing how much of what uh, has happened in one's life has not been due to one's own power, but due to things beyond themselves. So to put it very simply, none of us give birth to ourselves. We all need uh, an incredible amount of care to uh, before we're able to take care of ourselves. Um, and so this is why the mother is often central in Nikon, because the mother is the, the earliest caretaking figure in the Nikon world. And so by looking at the how we are taken care of by others, even when we don't behave well, this is um, analogous to what Amida does for us. Um, I could say more, but I don't want to. I, I mean, I don't want to. I get it. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
a, a Japanese word that is often used in this context is ikasareteru, which is hard to translate, but it means made to live uh, or lived. Um, and so a lot of people doing Nikon, they say, you know, after doing Nikon, I realized that I wasn't living by my own power, but I was living uh, due to the, 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 the care of others. Here's a question. Uh, I've not been identifying the questioners, and I, I'm not going to identify this one except to say that this, con this one comes from a mutual friend. And <laughs> if you can't guess who that is, <laughs> then we have a problem. Um, this person is asking to consider, if you consider the, the life of a novice monk, an unsui, a Zen monk, um, going through a four stages from petitioning for acceptance at a Zen practice temple to the first trip home, bed rest, isolation, bowing at the steps alone and so on. Do you see analogs here between this and Morita's four stage therapy? So, so I think one could see analogs, but, and other people have suggested these kind of analogs and, and Morita denied it. Morita said, you know, I, I found this through, you know, there was a, um, uh, in the in the late nineteenth century, there was a man named Otto. I'm forgetting his last name because of the beam. Anyway, there was this idea of bed rest that was already out there, and so he was reading things um, uh, in German that were going on outside of Japan, and he said he got the idea of bed rest um, from from those from that those sources rather than from from Zen ones. I may have overstated how many questions there are. And it could, if, if I have overlooked anyone's question, please, could you send it to me again in the Q&A uh, uh, format? Uh, let me ask a question, one of mine here. Um, if, can you be, are there sort of specific critiques of North American mindfulness that one can find by either Morita or Nikon um, practitioners. So you know it's 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 interesting because when I when I presented on mindfulness at a Nikon conference um, for mostly psychiatrists and psychotherapists, what what they <laughs> what they thought was a good idea is that you could get people to do like a, a little mindfulness practice, which would help them settle down so they could then transition into to Nikon. So this idea of kind of using mindfulness to help people get into Nikon started to, to become an idea that certain people um, started to, to do in Japan. There's a, there's a psychiatric hospital in Nagasaki that was doing this for a while. And then later, um, about a year later, I heard somebody who I did not know say that she was doing this at a clinic in, in Tokyo. So there's not really, people in the Morita Nikon world are not critical of um, mindfulness. Again, you know, for them, this is incoming, this is new. This is the, the, the latest fashion in Japan since about 2014 or so. Um, so they're not critical of, of mindfulness. I mean, Morita, I have heard a Morita doctor say, you know, you know mindfulness is, 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 is not new. I mean, many of the things mindfulness is suggesting, Morita was suggesting, a century earlier. Um, and you know, there's, there's, a, there's another therapy, which I didn't mention in the talk, called acceptance commitment therapy. And some people have said that the, uh, the person that started that therapy basically just copied much of what Morita was saying. Um, because again, the idea is to, you know, not to to evaluate how one feels about the situation so much as to act in the situation. Let me see just, there may be a technical issue that's arising because I see that the number of questions that are being sent in my direction, I believe are expanding clearly. But the last one that is showing up on my Q&A screen is actually my own question. Are there specific sort of critiques of North American mindfulness? Connie, if you have access to additional questions that I have not yet posed, if you could send them to me, that would be a lovely thing. Clark, are there any other thoughts that you've had that uh, you didn't have time to share or th thoughts to share with us? So, I mean, the interesting thing is 
Nikon and Morita, so psychotherapy was not um, popular in Japan at any time. Really in the past 20 years or so, cognitive behavioral therapy has taken off. Um, so people often say, well, you know, Morita and Nikon are not representative of therapy in Japan because it's so biologically driven. But what I will say is that of the few psychotherapies that were being used in the 50s, 60s, 70s, you know, these were pretty important therapies. So even though they were not done by a majority of, of uh, mental health care workers, psychiatrists and psychotherapists, um, they were still fairly uh, influential in their own right. Beautiful. I've gotten some of these questions here, and I'm very thankful. These, these are incredibly interesting questions to me, and I hope you're enjoying this back and forth. Um, here's a question. Nikon and Morita therapies are both focusing inwards to themselves, but many people with addictions and other mental health issues may be triggered by trauma, such as child abuse, sexual violence, oppression, war trauma, and so on. While the, um, while the focus of mindfulness can be promising to address psychological issues, if the roots of the issues are societal in nature, it may drive people to blame themselves for their suffering. Is there an agreed upon criteria for, or are there agreed upon criteria for the use of Morita or Nikon for particular psychiatric issues? Right, so that, that, that's a good question because Morita therapy does not try to be a therapy for, for many different types of mental illness. It's mostly a therapy for people who have uh, what Morita called nervous temperaments or nervous disposition. So people with anxiety disorders, but Morita is not used for people with depression typically. It's typically not, not used for people with addiction. Uh, actually the, bed, the, 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 uh, the first stage of the four stage therapy could also be, have uh, a diagnostic element to it. So what Morita found is that if someone were schizophrenic and tried to do the first um, bed rest period, they just couldn't do it. They would get up and they would try to escape. They just couldn't do it. And so he would know at that point that this person was not just someone with, you know, with, with anxiety disorders or was something else going on there. And then for people with depression, what would happen is after the first period was over, they wouldn't want to get out of bed. They were happy just to stay there longer. And so again, this was an indication that this was you know, not the right therapy for them. Um, Nikon's case is different. Nikon has been used for all kinds of things. It's been used for depression. It's been used for addiction intervention. It's been used for personality disorders. And the addiction, I'll focus on the addiction, but the general reason, because this is a commonly asked question, about wouldn't this cause people to have more trauma, you know, particularly thinking about the troubles and difficulties that, um, you know, one, one caused others. So if you give me a minute, I'm gonna just draw kind of an illustration here sure. that will hopefully kind of like make the point. So this is, This is the view of one's life. Pre Nikon. Okay, and in one's life, you're going to have good things and bad things. Okay, and so this might be a little hard to see, but there's like a little box. Oh, I got it. Good, good. Yeah, yeah. With like the X's are bad things, the O's are good things, right? Got it. Now, someone with trauma, uh, with severe trauma, their, their kind of life looks like this. That big X yes. is the trauma, which is very much occupying most of their, their life. Yeah. Now, Nikon does not, does not try to diminish that trauma. It doesn't say, oh, it doesn't try to, Say that that trauma was not a big deal or anything like that. But what Nikon does give me a moment here. So post Nikon, one's view of one's <laughs> life is much bigger. Yes. 
And so as a result, the trauma is no longer uh, as overwhelming as it was before. Relatively so diminished. Right. And so the idea is that when one does Nikon, they remember all kinds of things that they had not remembered before. And so there is very little evidence um, and thousands, tens of thousands of people have done Nikon. There's very little evidence that it triggers um, trauma uh, that um, you know, is dangerous for the person. Um, this next question follows up on the Nikon theme with uh, addiction, especially. Uh, the questioner asks, says, I'm interested especially in how people are thinking about addiction in scare quotes, which seems to me sort of ambiguously classed as a mental illness. How do, how do proponents of Nikon think about what accounts for this therapy success at treating addiction? So with treating addiction, whether it's substance abuse disorder, so that's typically alcohol in Japan, uh, or gambling addiction, because Nikon is also used for gambling addiction, um, it's abstinence. I mean, so the, the criteria uh, is that someone um, is being hospitalized. And typically, uh, the Japanese don't immediately hospitalize for alcoholism. I mean, usually the person is, is, is hospitalized for some physical ailment that's the consequence of uh, heavy drinking. Um, and then what happens is they lose their job, they get arrested, they have other things. Um, and so, um, and hospitalization for addiction, for alcoholism in particular, it's quite long in Japan. It can be anywhere from three months to eight months. Uh, insurance will pay for it. Uh, and the idea is, is that one problem people have with addiction uh, in Japan and other places in the world is that you know, they think either it wasn't that bad or that I'm only hurting myself. Uh, but in the process of doing Nikon, what they realize is one, that a lot of bad things happen as a consequence of their drinking um, or gambling. And number two, that they were not just hurting themselves, they were hurting other people in their lives. Um, so, Addiction in Japan commonly goes untreated. Uh, it's got to get pretty bad for uh, people to be hospitalized for, for alcoholism. So in, the, in, in North America, people go into treatment centers much more quickly for addiction than they would in Japan. Uh, you have high-performing addiction. You know, that's, that's an interesting one in a high-performing society. Uh, here's a question that I'm going to rephrase. I think I'm getting the cor correct gist of it. Uh, how important is it in for a person for persons in Japan, generally speaking, uh, to to uh, seek Japanese treatment, a homegrown treatment? Uh, so this is an irony. To my mind, this is an irony because you know if you read medical anthropology, <laughs> you know medical anthropologists often advocate for indigenous therapies being superior to ones that are important. But the, the Japanese are pretty hesitant to use Nikon and Morita, in part um, because they would prefer to get, they would prefer a biological intervention. They would prefer to take a pill. Um, they don't want to, to do these kind of therapies. Um, some, some people think of them as quote unquote old fashioned. Um, I've had, <laughs> I had one person say to me, uh, Nikon reminds them of, of moral education classes from high school. Um, and so even though these are indigenous therapies, the Japanese have not been quick to use them because of the heavy, heavy preference for biological interventions over psychotherapeutic ones. Here's a question that's a, a really informed question. Uh, this scholar asks, uh, where where did the therapies first gain ground, and how did the how were those therapies depicted? Uh, uh, it's a complex question. Did Morita and Nikon therapies initially win more adherence among psychiatrists working in private rather than public mental hospitals? Was part of the appeal of Morita and Nikon therapies for families that they obscured diagnoses of mental illness? Mm -hmm. So Morita, again, Morita is really just dealing with people with anxiety disorders, nervous temperaments. 
Um, and Morita was a psychiatrist. His students were psychiatrists. Uh, Morita therapy has been very limited to the psychiatric world. Um, more, much more so at least than, than Nikon. So Nikon, you know, Yoshimoto was not a psychiatrist. He had real no, he had no interest in psychotherapy. Uh, what happened was, is that when he was doing Nikon in the prisons, uh, the prison psychiatrist started to think that this might be useful for some of their patients. Uh, and in, initially they thought it would be useful for patients with psychosomatic disorders. Um, because what they were finding is that a lot of these guys that had done Nikon seriously in prison, they would not return to prison. And so they saw some type of personal transformation in those prisoners. Um, and so in the early 1960s, some psychiatrists started to try to use it um, as an intervention for you know, psychosomatic disorders and, and addiction, particularly alcoholism, because they were having no success, really. They were just not having any success. And so they just thought, well, we'll just try this. Um, the majority of hospitals in Japan, psychiatric hospitals in Japan are private which is one of the reasons why it is hard to reduce the numbers. Um, so they are not government funded. So, you know, it was real easy for Reagan to cut the number of psychiatric hospital beds in the United States. He just cut government funding. Uh, but with Japan, because they're not as dependent uh, on government funding, uh, at least not directly, kind of indirectly they are with, with, with health insurance, um, that, you know, it's, it's much harder to close them down. It's much harder to diminish their numbers. Mark, this is about as informative a lecture as I think I've heard in the last five years. This oh, is great. Sure. Thank you for your stamina in this. Uh, a really cool former student of mine points out that, or asks that, are there people who go for Nikon a second, third, or however many times, you know? In other words, it didn't catch the first time, didn't catch the second time, but oh, you need to keep doing it. And, and if that is the case, you know, how have they stated how the latter times, the more success, the successful time, let's say, how did the successful time, why was it different from their initial experiences? This, this stu former student also thanks you for the great research talk. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So, uh, yes, some people do it more than once. It's not that unusual. It's not the majority. Um, but many people who become pretty actively involved in Nikon and who write about their Nikon experiences. They often mention doing it more than once, typically two or three, sometimes four or five. Uh, you know, there was a guy I met at a conference, he did it 10 times. Uh, people that run these Nikon training centers, they've done it many, many, many times. So the guy that ran the, the, uh, the center in Tokyo, he did Nikon for three months once. Um, and what happens is, is you know, the, sometimes the first time it doesn't catch because people um, they just can't get into it, um, or they do it one time and it's fantastic, and then they want to do it again. Um, so there's, you know, they might also have done it at one time when they were having a problem, had success doing it, and then later in life, maybe 10 years later, they're having a different problem, you know, uh, so let's say maybe they were initially having a problem at school, university, and then 10 years later, they're having a problem in their marriage or raising their kids. And so they might do it at different times when they have different problems in life. Here's a question that uh, I find this, this question absolutely fascinating. I'm going to rephrase it, I think, once again. Though. People today, often for private voluntary reasons, undertake spiritual practices like waterfall training. Uh, oh, sure, yeah. You know, they can do it either as monastics or they can do it as lay people. But these kinds of ascetic practices have certainly become separated from medical or mental health care. Uh, how did that separate? What are the implications of that separation? So this is the medicalization of these treatments. So as anybody that knows even a little bit about Japan knows that the Japanese uh, are pretty adamant that they're not religious in many cases. So, you know, it's not that they're hostile to religion, it's just not, you know, sometimes they're hostile to religion, but typically like we're not religious. And so religion in Japan is a pretty restrictive category. And this is, this is why Morita, even though he would use this Zen language quite frequently, actually, he would often also say, but my ideas do not come from Zen or, you know, 
I'm just using Zen to illustrate my, my thinking so people can understand it. Uh, because again, he didn't want people to think he, what he was doing was religious. So if you say something is religious in Japan, then people are, <laughs> it's unattractive, it's disengaging. But if you say it's medical, then it sounds like it's something that is uh, valid and we can use it. Uh, so, you know, if you say it's religious, you say, well, I'm not religious, so why would I do this? Um, so characterizing things, including mindfulness, by the way, you know, mindfulness is often characterized as, you know, a form of complementary medicine rather than religious. John Kabat-Zinn was very concerned in the 70s and 80s that, that, that mindfulness would be seen as religious because people would not do it. So you make it medical so people will do it. You characterize it as medical so people will take it seriously. I like that answer. Uh, here's a question. Uh, I think we know the answer, but are there practitioners of Morita therapy or Nikon outside of Japan? Yes, obviously. Yes. But so. how have those therapies, have those therapies been adapted to different local circumstances? A little bit. I mean, it's the type of people who come are quite different. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm most familiar with what's going on in the Nikon world outside of, of Japan. So in German speaking Europe, Austria, Germany, there's several Nikon centers. Um, most of the people who do Nikon at those centers are people who have uh, an interest in Buddhism um, or they're people who have addiction problems. So, you know, addiction is again used. So there's a, there's a place in Europe that's uh, an addiction treatment center which uses Nikon. Um, but if you look at the testimonials, what's interesting to me and to other people who look at this, is that what Japanese people say uh, and what non-Japanese people say, it's not radically different. I mean, there's some cultural things, like some cultural expectations that are different. So, you know, people complain, for example, that in Japan that, you know, my mother did not make me food when I was 18 years old, where, you know, Europeans might not say that or Americans might not say that. So there's some cultural differences, but surprisingly pretty similar. I mean, my colleague goes out to Silva sometimes, you know, when she gives presentations on Nikon, she, she gives different testimonials from around the world and tries to guess, get people to guess if they're from Japan or not from Japan. And people are not very successful at guessing which are Japanese and which aren't actually. I'm conflating uh, two questions here and uh, it results in something that's a little bit complicated, but think about like sort of Buddhist teachings regarding oneness or gratitude or infinite love and compassion of Buddha, or Mushin, no mind, so on. Uh, how do, the, do these figure at all in uh, Buddhist therapies? Oh, and, and by the way, add a corollary to that. And is there, what is the place here for feelings? So, Morita, again, Morita and Nikon are pretty different in their approaches to these things. So. Morita, the problem, again, Morita is dealing with people with anxiety disorders, nervous temperaments. And for, for Morita therapists, feelings and the way people think about their feelings with nervous temperaments is a problem. They tend to think too much about them. They tend to focus on them and they make it worse. You saw in the video that the guy wasn't supposed to you know, write about himself. Um, you, know, you saw in the video, no talking, people who talk don't get cured. The idea is to focus on the action, um, to focus on the action, not the feelings. Um, Nikon, similar to that, uh, says, you know, rather than focus on the feelings, one should focus on what the reality is. Um, and that feelings can color one's uh, view of one's life. So to keep it brief, for example, we have a negativity bias. Uh, in other words, it's easier, we are more likely to remember an insult than a compliment because we have a, a, <laughs> a bad book review than a good book review. Yeah, exactly. You know, you would need 10 fantastic book reviews to cancel one bad review. Um, because as one neuropsychiatrist put it, our brains are like Velcro for the negative and Teflon. <laughs> and so this is why Nikon doesn't have a fourth question. You know, this is why. You don't look at uh, the troubles and difficulties other people did to us or caused us. 
because we don't need any practice uh, thinking about the troubles and difficulties others have caused us. It just comes naturally to us. So the idea is that um, feelings do play a role in, in, in Nikon, but typically the feelings are ones of gratitude, although you don't have to feel grateful. I mean, Nikon does not say you have to feel grateful. Your aim is to feel grateful. Many Nikon practitioners say uh, the aim is to, uh, to do the questions. That's the, you do the questions and then whatever happens, happens. Um, so it is not, I think for both, it's not results driven. It's process driven more than results driven. Here's a, here's a question with a, a distinctly contemporary quality to it. Uh, have Nikon or Morita therapies been used in treating or helping futoko, uh, internet or game addiction, and even to assist uh, intellectually gifted kids, uh, let's say nerdy kids, to adapt to social life? So it has, yes, there have been some studies on, on Nikon, um, particularly for game addiction. Interestingly enough, the Chinese have um, you know centers for youth to go to which are addicted to video games and i have seen studies come out of taiwan uh, about nikon being used uh there for game addiction and internet addiction um with the the um not going to school which was a major issue in the in the late 60s 70s um nikon was definitely used for that uh, school counselors will use Nikon in Japan. Um, I certainly meet school counselors when I go to Nikon um, conferences. Um, it's hard to get people who are hikikomori, uh, these, these shut-ins to do yes. Nikon because they won't leave the room. Yes. Wow. wow. Uh, here, I, this is, I think, going to be the last question for the evening. You've shown remarkable stamina. And this is a painfully difficult question, so it's, okay. we'll want to conclude okay. with this one. Um, in the video, the participant mentions that he has not been paying enough attention to pure experience. Uh, the term I think is Junsui Keiken. This term Junsui Keiken, pure experience, uh, the questioner wonders if this can be traced all the way back, but it's only 20 years, right? To Nishida Kitaro and the pure experience in the 1910s. Any thoughts about that? I think Nishida Kitaro is the most overstudied figure in Japanese intellectual history, but we'll save that for another discussion. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know to what extent the person in that video knew anything about Nishida Kitaro. Yeah. Um, I think people are interested in Nishida Kitaro. They could look at Nikon from a particular perspective. But again, Morita and Morita therapists and psychiatrists, they do not want people engaging in too much intellectual gymnastics. They want people to get out there and do things. Um, so, you know, I think that that particular question might be one that would be interesting at a Morita therapy conference uh, to talk about in the abstract, but in terms of using it, as a therapeutic intervention, I seriously doubt it. Um, I'm gonna ask your indulgence to ask one more question because okay. it's coming from a friend of mine. And okay. I wouldn't, sure, sure, sure. Uh, that makes it special. So how do practitioners of Nikon feel about new religions like Seicho no Iya, which is said to emphasize gratitude for nature and family? Uh, again, there's, <laughs> you know, there's not, you know, Nikon practitioners don't have strong views on, on uh, other religious organizations. Um, you know, they themselves don't want to be seen as a new religion. Uh, but, you know, new religions uh, have used uh, Nikon, interestingly enough. Um, so, you know, you occasionally find new religions using Nikon, uh, which is, you know, as a way of, of generating gratitude. And people in the Nikon world they don't try to get them to stop. They're like, you know, this is, this is, this is, we don't own this. We don't have a copyright on this. Um, so GLA, for example, the, they used to do a lot of uh, uh, Nikon. And actually some former members of Omu Shindikyo also started doing Nikon. As a we don't find this in Kofuku no Kagaku though, right? I don't think, no, I would, yeah. I don't, it wouldn't, right. it wouldn't match Kofuku no Kagaku. Right. <laughs> yeah. I would be shocked. Let's put it that way. Yeah. 
Clark, I think the only thing that's left is for me on behalf of all of the audience and uh, your colleagues here at uh, UBC and Asian Studies and elsewhere in other departments to thank you for this wonderful talk. I'm quite mindful of the fact that it's closing on 11 p.m. in your time zone and you've shown a st remarkable stamina, great goodwill, so much authority in the way that you answered the questions. And so really thank you from the bottom of my heart to you. Thank you very, very much. I look forward to seeing you on a handful more occasions during your time virtually with us here at UBC. Thank you.